Hi students, welcome to Year 11 Biology and the last in our series of videos on cells as the basis of life. You have already done some work, in fact quite a lot of work in class on the effect of the environment on enzyme activity and so I just want to pull together some of those ideas in this final video. So specifically what you're asked to do is investigate the effect of environment on enzyme activity through the collection of primary or secondary data. And so it's important that you've had the opportunity to work through some primary data to look specifically at some factors that you chose to vary and how they impacted on enzyme activity and how you measured enzyme activity and also the fact that we couldn't investigate all factors in the class so we have to have a look at some secondary data as well to get a picture of exactly what the factors are that affect enzyme activity. So hopefully by now most of what we're going to look at in this uh, video is familiar to you but if not let's just make sure that we're really clear with all of these things. Enzymes are proteins. They are a specific group of biomolecules that are involved in catalyzing uh, chemical reactions within cells. The important thing about these is they are specific and their specificity relates directly to their structure. And these are two important points because what we're going to do when we vary the environmental conditions is we actually can cause some change in the structure of the enzymes and therefore that limits their ability to work at an optimum level. And of course optimum is a word that we use when we're describing the activity of enzymes because there is usually a point where we will see a peak in the curve either like this or a peak that kind of runs to a point and then levels off. So at some point there is a point of maximum activity and these would be regarded as the optimum levels uh, of activity for the particular enzyme that we're looking at. What we do know is the main factors that affect enzyme function are substrate concentration, temperature and pH. pH is just another word for acidity. Now, again, we make a lot of generalizations about enzymes, but the important thing to remember is different enzymes have different sets of conditions. So enzymes in your mouth, for example, which may have a pH that is uh, closer to neutral, may not um, function where, for example, in the stomach, the um, pH is much more acidic and maybe closer to one or two. So these are very different levels of uh, acidity and um, they correspond to the optimum function of different types of enzymes. Uh, a, a salivary enzyme, amylase, that's working in your mouth and a protease or a protein digesting enzyme which may be working in your stomach. Likewise, temperature is one of those things where we kind of work on our own optimum body temperatures of about 37 degrees. That often is the optimum temperature for a number of different enzymes, but isn't the only one. And certainly we do know that there's a number of different types of organisms that are able to survive in extreme temperature, for example, um, and their optimum values may be much higher than 37. Substrate concentration is an interesting one because it doesn't tend to follow the same pattern as some of the graphs that we can produce of enzyme function against temperature and pH. The thing with substrate concentration is it's more like the second one here. That is, as we increase the concentration of the substrate, all of the substrate molecules are able to find active sites on the enzyme. And you can see here a um, very simplified diagram and there would be the specific active site. So it's looking for a vacant active site in order to form a, an enzyme substrate complex. As we increase the concentration of the substrate without changing uh, the concentration of the enzyme, we will reach a saturation point. Um, and at the saturation point, we have um, effectively substrate molecules or substances um, which uh, can find no active sites. And as a result, 
um, they can't bind. So, um, so there is a point with substrate concentration where the rate of reaction will increase up to a certain point and then it'll level off. It doesn't matter how much more substrate you add after that point, you've reached the optimum level, so you can't go beyond that. There's no more active sites available for the extra substrate. Now, one of the problems with optimum values around um, temperature and uh, acidity in particular is both of these in extreme can damage the three-dimensional structure of the enzymes. Now, enzymes being proteins are long chains of amino acids and if all they were is long chains of amino acids we would probably call them polypeptides because it is a peptide bond that links two amino acids together so um, effectively you know how many peptide bonds you have by just subtracting one from the total number of uh, amino acids that you have the problem is this isn't a long straight chain of amino acids. This is a complex three-dimensional structure that has lots of folding um, and therefore a number of different types of bonds for the chemists among you. Um, hydrogen bonds are one of the most important ones that actually link parts of these very long complex molecules together. So all I do is they're not chemical bonds in the same sense that they're all chemically, all the atoms are bonded to each other chemically, but there is a force of attraction holding certain parts of the molecules together. And that's what creates active sites. That's what creates this three-dimensional structure, whether we've talked about a, a lock and key or an induced fit model. Each of these models are just trying to describe the fact that there is a specificity in the relationship between the substrate and the enzyme. The problem of course is when we have extreme conditions of temperature and or pH they can actually start to break these bonds down. They can start to interfere with the three-dimensional structure and start to pull it out. In extreme cases what we actually have is a process known as denaturing. It changes the nature of the enzyme to the point where it uh, is unable to return to its original shape. Now this isn't always the case with extremes of temperature. In fact, um, cooler temperatures may um, unravel or change the shape of the molecule somewhat, but when they are warmed, they may return to their original shape and function. But in high temperatures and sometimes in high acidity conditions, the, the changes that are made to the three-dimensional structure of the enzymes can be permanent. And therefore, um, that would mean that there is no further way that that enzyme could reform and uh, refunction the way that it previously did. So the important thing that you need to do is to keep in mind that there will be an optimum, for example, temperature. If we were to look at a graphing temperature, then we would find that we could read off from this graph what the optimum temperature was, what the range of temperatures, which gave us fairly uh, good function for these uh, for this particular enzyme, and also the fact that you can see away from the optimum, the uh, activity falls very, very quickly. And that's another problem with enzymes. They do have uh, specificity in terms of the chemical reactions they're involved with, but they also tend to have a very narrow range of environmental conditions that need to be met. And if they're not met, then the enzyme does not function well or at all. And you can see there's a rapid drop off as the temperature is getting very high in this particular graph. We really do um, have a big problem with the enzyme. And of course, this is because it's heading towards denaturation. It's actually heading towards a point where it can no longer recover and function as an enzyme. There are a couple of other factors that are possibly worth mentioning, and I don't want to talk about this too much, but I think it's important that you're aware of the fact that because these are very complex molecules, they can bond with more than just their substrate. So um, we've talked about the fact that the enzyme has an active site, a site that bonds to the substrate. And you can see in the little um, model that we've got here that um, all things being reasonable, you plug uh, the little plug into the um, holes in the um, PowerPoint and everything works perfectly. But we can actually have the same enzyme being uh, linked to other chemicals. Um, allosteric site is basically not the active site, not the point where the substrate is going to bind, but the presence of another chemical in that position may actually um, inhibit 
in some way stop that substrate uh, enzyme complex from forming properly. So you can see here, we've called it a non-competitive inhibitor because it's not actually bonding to the active site and stopping the substrate from bonding directly. But what it is doing is it's bonding to another chemical in such a way that it is having an effect on that enzyme substrate complex that forms. Cofactors are one of the additional things that you can look at when you're looking at the factors that affect enzyme function. And these are just the sort of things that you need to um, just start to get a little bit of an idea uh, about. So this was a pretty good uh, place for us to finish our discussion of cells. Thanks for watching.